This is my sister, Pauline, and me. I'm 10 years old, and she's two years younger than me. We live in Paris, and as you may know, French people love to demonstrate. We would do this as family. So here we are, very excited about this day. We had prepared signs that we would hold during the march, and some were actually bigger than us. That day, thousands of people had gathered. And I remember myself sitting up there, watching, fascinated, the sea of moving hands around me everywhere. Never in my life I had seen as many deaf people. We were there, gathered as a community, to ask the government to officially recognize our language, sign language, my first language. My father, my mother, and my sister are deaf, not me. I'm the only one hearing person in my family, and the odds for this are lower than being struck by lightning, twice. So I grew up in a deaf world, a silent world, but it was a warm and cozy cocoon. I had a wonderful childhood. And my parents were parts of the deaf community, and in the deaf community, everybody knew each other. We would go to deaf parties, join deaf trips, play tennis at deaf clubs. Everyone we would go, we would see sign language. People would speak sign language. It was the glue that united our community together into one single big family. In this family, if you had a remarkable trait, you would be named after that. I remember Big Nose, one friend of my father. He was a deaf restaurant owner, and Chatty Mouth. She was a chatterbox, one of my mom's best uh, best friend. My name was Thibaut, T shaking head, T as my, the first letter of my name, and shaking head as a movement I was doing when my mother would shampoo me. <laughs> They named me T shaking head. But the deaf community is also something very direct. People don't have pretensions. If you didn't like the conversation you were in, you could just switch and look at another person. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Wouldn't it be awesome if we all <laughs> if we all speak sign language here, all of us? Unfortunately, this is not the case most of the time. Outside of the deaf world where I grew up in, the hearing world, the world that you live in, with your two valid ears, a world where no one almost speaks sign language, and that was usually because of that that most deaf people had problems to interact with it. When I grew up, I felt this weight all the time. I was the ambassador trying to build bridges between those two worlds. At age five, I started my career. It all started with phone calls. When the phone rang, a, a, a system of flashing lights would trigger all across the room, and I would run and run to the phone and answer. My parents would come later, notified by the light, and we would interpret together. At that time, TV was not captioned. You couldn't see any movie. If I wasn't there next to the screen interpreting for my parents, we watched Amelie a lot. I, was, I used to accompany them out there in the world. I used to help them understand and communicate, because that was important. We used to go in museums, post office, banks, or even doctor. I can tell you, at the doctor, there was way too much information shared to a kid <laughs> to handle. <laughs> But it felt natural. It felt normal. That was the right thing to do. Deaf and hard of hearing people need to read your lips to understand what you say. But lip reading only gets you to 25% of the information. So try to imagine. Somebody talks to you, you look at them in the eyes, and you get one word out of four, barely. Let's say that you can manage to fill the blanks and be smart about it. Then I add a second and a third person. Each time the first person stops talking, the other person starts. So you miss the first words, and you miss the points, you miss the concept, the jokes, all the time. You get lost. You're in a constant ping-pong match where the chances of you keeping up decrease to zero very quickly. That was the day-to-day -day life for them. I remember 
My sister, the first time she got into a mainstream school with other hearing kids, she tried to keep up and she tried so hard. Group conversations were the worst for her, but that was where social life happened. That small hassle in the communication difference between the hearing people and her was enough to keep her outside of their group. It was like this wall of silence was built between her and the rest. And seen from afar, you couldn't see it, but it was there, invisible. So she drifted away, back to the deaf world, where she had hundreds and hundreds of friends. It was easier for her. You know, what was the point of struggling and fighting just to get a handful of hearing friends? Both of us knew that the world was bigger than just the deaf world. But we had to accept that. I was powerless, she was powerless. She was in a gilded cage, because that was the deaf world for her. And I felt powerless for years and for years, until four years ago, when I met Anshu Gupta in India. Anshu, 40 years old, has founded a social enterprise who helps poor people get dignity through clothes. He transforms valuable goods and valuable clothes from the wealthy and make it into valuable resources for the poor people. He's not the first guy who noticed there was poverty in India, but he did something about it. Why him and not the others? That's what I asked him. And now when I asked him this question, he answered to my question by another question, one that changed my life. Thibaut, what makes you angry? That's why he asked me. Thibaut, what problem in your life makes you so angry, so frustrated that you could devote the next 10 years of your life finding a solution to it? I was stunned. <laughs> I don't get 10 year life questions like that all the time. Anger. This very violent behavior, this temporary loss of control, where you do things that afterwards you regret immediately. It all happened to us. But the anger that drive Anshu is different. It's much deeper. It gave him energy and purpose over the years. It was the real deal. And when I asked myself what kind of anger I had, only one answer went through the test of time. At that time, the laws and the life of deaf hard-of-hearing people had improved a bit for accessibility. TV was now captioned with subtitles. Phones were now interpreted through video interpreters. But the social dynamics were still the same. Those two worlds had never been as far apart. The rest of the, the world was going together through English and globalization and all of this. But the deaf and the hearing world still standed separated by this big wall, this big silent wall. And that was frustrating. My sister still had this endless series of struggles. She was now in college, and she had to rely on seven friends just to compile together enough notes to attend classes. She would work three times harder than anyone else just to be at the normal baseline. And that was frustrating. But that was not just my deaf people. At that Christmas that year, I had met my grandparents, and I noticed something different was with them. They were starting losing their hearing. And because of that, like so many other people in the world, they couldn't keep up with the conversation anymore at Christmas dinners. And I saw in their eyes, as they were standing still on the dinner table, the same frustration and the same isolation that I had grew up with. It was not just deaf people. People above 75 years old are more likely to be hard of hearing than not. If it's not you who's going to be hard of hearing, it's your neighbor. 400 million people, 5% of the world population today, struggles because of their disabling hearing loss. Every day, they go in business meetings, family dinners, group conversations, hang out with friends, and they cannot follow and keep up. They're being denied a fully rich and social professional life. Really? Are we gonna just let this happen? I felt this anger growing, growing up in me. 
because the only solution they had today was interpreters and captioners. People that you would pay $100 an hour just to get the transcript of the conversation. But would you grab coffee with a friend and pay $100 for this all the time? Would you go on a date and have a third person sitting next to you <laughs> to the conversation? Right, sometimes it can be useful. <laughs> deaf people, most of deaf and hard of hearing people, were giving up on those opportunities. They were isolating themselves from their social life. And that was what was making me the most angry. And when I connected to this anger, hearing Anshu, that gave me the energy I needed just to do the first step and to start looking for a solution and to start moving forward. It pushed me over the next years. I thought we could end this isolation. I was convinced of it now. The wall could be broken down. We could reunite both of those worlds. Not just the deaf or hard of hearing people. You could. You can. With the smartphone in your pocket. You see here, this microphone? You use it for two things. Calling people and Siri. Well, if you use Siri. Siri, let's talk about it. 40 years of technological innovation, all packed into a phone. It's not artificial intelligence where you can just talk to it and it transcribes whatever you say. But wait a minute, what do you use Siri for? Setting up alarms? Dictating your text while you're driving? Really? I thought artificial intelligence helped cars drive themselves. You could detect cancer through photos of an eye. And what we were doing with speech recognition? Setting up reminders? Really? Can we not use this technology to help millions of deaf and hard hearing people? What if we would take the audio information of a conversation and use it, and use this artificial intelligence to make the information visually accessible? That's Ava. Ava is an app that you can open on your laptop or your phone. It connects all the smartphones in a room together in a group conversation to hear what each person has to say. And in less than a second, transcribes it in color to the deaf person so they can follow the conversation with you. It's like captioning on TV, but for real conversations, conversations that matter. We've built today the fastest captioning system in the world so that my family, my co-founder, deaf as well, but millions of deaf and hard of people can follow everyday conversations and feel included. One of them is Jenna. Jenna wrote me a letter describing my, me how Eva changed her life. She's held Eva at church to finally understand what the pastor was talking about. <coughs> She's held Eva in restaurants to feel part of the banter between her friends and the waiter. She used to miss this. She held Eva at the doctor's office, ordering an Americano and, it, it, uh, and her oatmeal at Starbucks. Jenna is a massage therapist, so she has clients. She would spend days in silence. Now she's Eva with her clients, just to be able to transform this silence into real conversations. Now she giggles with them. Then I used to be afraid of going out with friends at night, for camping, for example. Because of the darkness, she couldn't read lips. She felt her entire life isolated. With Eva, she had a companion in her pocket, and she could feel she belonged again. Jenna cried the first time she used Eva. I mean, when's the last time you've cried using an app? How many other Jenna's are out there, ready to be helped, ready to discuss with you, so that you can see their cultures and share their stories? Last Thanksgiving, Eva connected thousands of families together. I felt in my heart, I heard, I swear I heard, the first loud crack in this wall of silence. 
it is a virtuous cycle. Each conversation, successful, is one over silence and isolation. And it gives us more energy to push further and bring further the boundaries of accessibility so that we can maybe one day bring closer a totally accessible world. I remember when I was younger, I felt so frustrated not to be present for my family when they needed me. Last week, my sister met her professor. He was hearing, she was deaf, she used Eva to communicate. And I was millions of miles away, and finally, I could be there for her. But she's the real badass in the story. <laughs> in a few years, she will become the first deaf lawyer in France. <laughs> Sorry, sister. <laughs> Sorry, sister, a lot of pressure. <laughs> no, really. But think about it. What brought us here is the question from Anshu. What makes you angry in your world? What makes you angry that you could spend the next 10 years of your life doing something about it? Ask yourself this question. Let it sink. You may not have an answer to it right away. You may feel uncomfortable. Dig deep. Connect with maybe this anger. Amplify it. If you can find the fire within you, know that this is an incredible power. And I hope you can draw from it. And I hope that you can change the world with this because the world needs you to do this. Thank you. <laughs>